Is people generally uh, uh, join little late? No, as as per your convenience. I'm okay, free. so because we follow the military precision, so time means time. So yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so maybe because of the weather, we'll give one or two minute concession. Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Lakshman Kumar Behra, the chairperson of the Special Center for National Security Studies, uh, Jawaharlal Jawahar Nehru University, JNU. I, on behalf of my colleagues, welcome you all to this important webinar on Indian Air Force Doctrine 2022. Uh, well, as you might be knowing, the Indian Air Force recently released its uh, revised doctrine, which is titled uh, Doctrine of the Indian Air Force with a forward from the Chief of chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Bhia Choudhury. The basic philosophy of the doctrine, as I understand, is to transform the Air Force from a mere air power to a space power. The latest doctrine is elaborated over 80 pages and is the fourth iteration since the first doctrine was published in 1995. The latest iteration is part of the doctrinal evolution of the Indian Armed Forces. As you know, all the three services, Army, Navy, and Air Force, have their own doctrines. And we have also a tri-service doctrine released from the headquarter integrated defense staff. These doctrines help us to understand how the Indian Armed Forces are planning and preparing themselves to fight and win India's next war. Now, the question is, why are we discussing the Air Force doctrine today? In fact, there are several reasons. First, the doctrine itself talks of its uh, talks of its greater understanding by the larger Indian or uh, uh, larger Indian audience, including universities, so that there is a better appreciation of the IF's fundamental approach towards military operations. I think JNU is the first university in the country to have taken up this subject uh, uh, to have taken up this subject for discussion, and we are happy for that. Second, and more importantly, the doctrine has a lot of implications on the two other forces. Uh, uh, on the implications of the other two forces, particularly the Indian Army. As you might be knowing, the government has established a new department uh, called the Department of Military Affairs and placed it under the Chief of Defense Staff, a post also created for the first time in the year 2020. One of the basic charters of the new establishment or the CDS is to create theater commands for joint war fighting. In this connection, the doctrine of any service needs to be perfectly harmonized with the doctrines of other services so as to achieve the optimum military effectiveness. To what extent the latest doctrine of the Air Force harmonizes with the doctrines of others is a subject of great discussion. And those who are following the subject would know that, that there is a differing version uh, or opinions on IF's latest doctrine. The third reason why we are discussing the IF doctrine has to do with resources, as you might be knowing. The Air Force may have about 25% share in the defense budget, but its share in the procurement budget, overall defense procurement budget is about 40%, which is highest among all the services. This shows the capital intensive nature of the IF. However, resources made available in the past have not proved, had not proven enough to meet some of the basic requirements of the Air Force. So any change in the doctrine without due regard to the likely availability of resources is likely to face a lot of challenges. I do hope the latest doctrine takes note of this reality. Uh, well, I'm not an expert uh, on the subject who can give a detailed presentation. Uh, for that, we have an eminently qualified speaker who knows the subject inside out. For the benefit of our participants, uh, who I can see uh, have joined in large number, I will briefly introduce our main speaker, Group Captain KK Khera, who has kindly agreed to speak in this webinar. Group Captain Kishore Kumar Khera served as a fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force for, for 33 years. He is an alumnus of National Defense Academy and Defense Services Staff College. He has served in plans and operational branches at Air Headquarters as well as in the High Commission of India in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He is a pioneer member of the Composite Battle Response and Analysis COBRA Group and headed the operational planning and assessment group at, 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 at air headquarters. He conceptualized, designed, and, and deployed multiple tools and processes for efficient and effective operational planning 
and execution. His publications include Lebanon, Yemen, a marathon, Hezbollah head and healthy legs, hybrid warfare, the changing character of conflict, which was published by the Pentagon Press in 2018. He has also authored uh, several other uh, seminal uh, uh, journal articles, which you can find, uh, find mostly in the IDS website. I thank Group Captain uh, Khera for agreeing to speak uh, in this webinar. Before I hand over the floor to him, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined uh, this event uh, and get numbers. We keenly look forward to your comments, observations, and questions after the presentation by uh, Group Captain Khera. I request all the participants to use the chat option to put uh, your comments or questions. Uh, with this, uh, may I now request uh, Group Captain Khera to make his presentation. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Professor Lakshman. I, it's a great honor for me to be interacting with the scholars and faculty of JNU and others who have joined this. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, he has given a very elaborate uh, background. I'll just take on from there. As far as uh, my introduction is concerned, that has been elaborate too. I try to describe myself in a single word, the word being soldier. That uh, holistically defines me as to who I am. Coming to the topic of the day, Indian Air Force Doctrine 2022, uh, I have just uh, about a dozen points on that, that I'll cover one by one. Uh, but before I commence to that, let me start a story, especially those who are not from military background. Uh, this is about a general who has been felicitated uh, after having won a war. And in the public forum, one uh, scholar asked him a question, Janal, is it not true that your soldiers who have uh, fought, shed their blood and sweat and have actually won the war? The general, without flinching his eyelids, just said, yes, that is true. But had the war been lost, I would have lost it. That actually sums up the mil military ethos almost across the globe. It is universal. Now, coming to the IF doctrine, it is uh, called Indian Air Publication 2000-22. Uh, this uh, nomenclature of 2000 came into being after uh, the first version was public, uh, publicly uh, declared in uh, 1995. That time, everyone was obsessed with the Y2K. And that is how the nomenclature of IAP 2000 came. And Dash 22 is its latest version, which was published last year and made public uh, this year. Okay. When, uh, before I start the discussion, I would just like to uh, quote from this aerospace power doctrine itself. Uh, it's the definition uh, which says, aerospace power doctrine refers to the central beliefs and principles that guide the Indian Air Force in employment of aerospace power in furtherance of national objectives. I think most of uh, the military practitioners or those who follow military would uh, appreciate that uh, this is a near perfect definition of a doctrine and uh, it's all encompassing. And uh, I would like to give a lot of credit to the uh, team that has uh, brought out this doctrine and uh, has elaborately catered for almost entire spectrum of uh, operations. But we will revisit this uh, definition a little later after I cover a couple of uh, points. As far as the structure of IAP 2000-22 is concerned, it is uh, split into seven chapters. Vision core values, basically standard from the IEF. As far as uh, the next chapter is concerned, it uh, relates aerospace power with principles of war and uh, thereafter aerospace power with national security. And therefore, uh, thereafter, it is evolving aerospace power doctrine. The next chapter, a little intriguing, air strategy. And uh, last is the preparation of future. And before that is aerospace power in Indian context. If you notice one thing uh, which stands out is everywhere the term that has been used is aerospace, except for strategy, which is air, possibly someone uh, lost the energy to uh, change the change the thing uh, from air to aerospace 
as far as the jointness and integration was concerned that uh, the chairman was talking about i just quote something uh, what the chief of air staff has written in the four word and it says it is important that such flexible assets is talking about the air power assets aircraft basically combat aircraft primarily it is important that such flexible assets are employed cohesively as per the emerging situation and not limited to con constrained stage usage in a defined area or in a particular role i like to reemphasize defined area and a particular role this basically relates to if belief that the construct of geographical theater commands or giving a role of air defense command and splitting the assets is not uh, not optimal as far as the forward is concerned given by the chief of air staff and it is uh, clear with this now uh, coming to the basics what is a doctrine doctrine as per this uh, document is a body of thoughts and teachings a shared way of thinking a set of proven and existing concepts principles capabilities capacities structures related to the use of military during war and peace very heavy words very long as far as a soldier is concerned like me i simply say doctrine is just a belief system belief system what will work in which situation and how it will work best that is a belief system and that comes with experience but whose belief system is this if doctrine is it institutional or those of the individuals who have got together as a team and generated this document and is everyone on board it normally doesn't happen that everyone uh, has a identical belief system on the usage of concepts or use of application of air power or any uh, military aspect for that matter so doctrine basically uh, generates a something like a common minimum program that becomes a base document from where various people take on uh, their roles and uh, responsibilities and decision makers take their roles based on this basic platform and then move forward and it is not a be all and end all in itself and why is it important to articulate it up because it gives you a clarity of thought when you put it down on paper uh, there is a clarity that comes as to what is required what is there and how it is to be used so it becomes a base uh, document for further uh, analysis and progress how is a doctrine built it it's basically a belief system which is built by experience and the best experience comes in a war if that is not there through operations through exercises through ex experiments through innovations some ideas get accepted some rejected depending on how they have worked out and another aspect is by observing what is happening across uh, the world in the similar domains like a war is taking place in russia and uh, ukraine there is something happening uh, somewhere else so uh, the team observes all these things and tries and imbibes what is relevant in our scenario and then uh, important aspect is interaction when you interact with the uh, other militaries other air forces other uh, air powers uh, during exercises or during seminars or during exchanges uh, then you understand uh, what are the limitations and uh, expectations and how they are planning to use their technology how they planning to uh, use their assets and uh, what are the key areas you interact with them and learn from them and pick up your beliefs try and test them here then you do internal deliberations within the organization and after all this uh, you sum up uh, that knowledge articulate it refine it and finalize it that is how this one this document has come into be as a uh, it was covered the first version it came in 1995 that was an after effect of a rand report uh, which it mentioned that indian air force doesn't have an open doctrine so the first version uh, was uh, pulled out in 1995 thereafter it was revised in 2007 and then in 2012 and the later latest version is about 2022 now if uh, you followed uh, these doctrines they just reflect what is the state of affairs at that time because it is basically a belief system 
in 1995, uh, some of you may recall that uh, in 1991, four years prior to the first release of our document, India was facing a major financial crisis and there was a, we are on the verge of a default of payment. That is the time Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, became the finance minister under uh, in the P.V. Narasimha Rao's government. And that time, uh, we were in a very precarious situation and uh, the sovereign, sovereign government guarantee of government of India was not accepted by Bank of England. So physically 40 tons of gold was airlifted from India to London to be deposited in Bank of England so that we could get adequate forex for avoiding a default of payment. That was a very precarious situation. And that impacted armed forces as well. And uh, the budgets were really cut down uh, to bare minimum, just enough for survival. So under those conditions, first doctrine had come out. Therefore, you can see its reflection in that, that state of mind and that thought process. Then the next version of 2007 was after Kargil had happened in 1999. And I did a good uh, deal of uh, itself in that uh, and uh, more importantly, in 2002, Indian Air Force started uh, doing international exercises with foreign air forces. The French Air Force was the first one in 2002, and then in three United States Air Force, 2004 United States Air Force, and there and so on. These were very, very uh, eye-opening experiences as far as the impact of technology on execution of air war was concerned. While everyone knew what happened in 1991 Gulf War, but uh, knowing it first, first hand and in uh, pushed into a corner during this training exercise, saying that there is actually nowhere to hide unless you upgrade technologically. So under those circumstances, 2007 doctrine came into view. And thereafter, 2012 one was when we had started inducting FRA come in 2003, AVAX came in 2010 and so far is a large number, which was uh, state of the art aircraft at that time, as far as the combat aircraft was concerned. And uh, we started uh, inducting uh, more air defense uh, systems. That is the time a technology upgrade was taking place. It has just started. So 2012 uh, doctrine came in that background. And the current one is after a major event uh, uh, we can say Balakot and uh, there are the talk and how it panned out. So this uh, current doctrine has come after that uh, particular event. Now, if you look at all these uh, documents uh, holistically, you will see a shift gradually from being a conservative, docile, subdued, defensive, and only theoretical outlook in the doctrine in the earlier version to 2022 doctrine, which is practical, aspirational, and it has aggressive approach towards uses of aerospace power. Aerospace power inherently is aggressive in nature. Therefore, this doctrine is most practical as far as all the other uh, versions are concerned. And I would like to compliment the team which has uh, collated this and generated this doctrine. Now, a few changes that have taken place, major changes I will uh, just flag. Uh, first one is, this is the first time air power has been changed over to aerospace power. And I quote from this uh, document, aerospace power exploits the air and space continuum and its nature is a function of physical attributes of this damage. Whether it should be air power or aerospace power, it makes it very clear in this uh, document. As far as the stakes, stakeholders are concerned in air power, in our context, armed forces are there. All three services have their own uh, assets. Then there are paramilitary forces which have some assets. And then there's civil aviation. In the space uh, sector, besides these uh, three uh, prongs, you have the space agency, ISRO, DRDO, everyone comes into play. Now space is the high ground. It has strategic importance as far as the military operations are concerned and even for the civil applications. Now, there are two options available to us, either segregate air and space now, and possibly two decades later, when we realize the necessity, integrate them again, or join air and space right now and move progressively.
together. Both models are available in the world. Some are separating the two, some are uh, moving in a cohesive manner. As far as the aerospace power uh, attributes are concerned, both air and space, reach, flexibility, versus versatility, mobility, responsiveness, offensive lethality, trans-domain operational capability. Trans-domain is between air and space. So these are actually available uh, practically to all military forces across the globe uh, now. Even uh, if you say the land forces, they have all these attributes. The maritime forces, they have all these attributes. But the speed at which they execute that and the quantum, that varies depending on which domain you're operating. Now, one issue that uh, I have with this doctrine is uh, IEF and aerospace power are not synonymous. You can't use them interchangeably. Somehow I get a feeling that it has been used interchangeably in this document and therefore it doesn't give a very good uh, clear picture of what is aerospace power and what is Indian Air Force. And uh, that brings me to the next issue. Should an Indian Air Force doctrine cover issues outside the purview of Indian Air Force? That is a question mark I put because aerospace power does not mean Indian Air Force and vice versa. Indian Air Force is a subset of aerospace power. That brings me to the next uh, issue. If you look at the document, it uh, very clearly links up uh, national aim, national policy to national security strategy, national objectives, national security objectives, national military objectives, and then Indian Air Force objectives. Now I just picked up three strands, national security objectives, mili national military objectives, and Indian Air Force objectives. The first discrepancy, as I would call it, I see is, and as far as the national security objective is concerned, deterrence is the primary objective. Deter war. Then is defense, then is internal security, then is regional and international security and peace and stability. These are the four national security objectives. But when you translate, uh, go to the one step lower onto the national military objectives, it puts deterrence as number three and defense and military action as number one and two. I am I'm not sure if that is right because if you already initiated military action and already initiated other actions, then deterrence has a little relevance. Deterrence should be number one as is the case in national security objectives. Uh, then of course is internal security. They have national military objectives add HADR, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which is uh, it's eight to seven power and national building, and then is Atmanirbharta self sufficiency But when you look a step further, go down further into a further subset of Indian Air Force objectives, the first four match with the military objective, defense, aerospace defense, military action, offensive air action, deterrence, deterrence, internal security, internal security, HADR, HADR. Five absolutely identical, no problem. But then Indian Air Force has put an objective in this doctrine of regional and global peace and international stability, which is not a national military objective. So the question is, can Indian Air Force jump two steps and be independently a player in regional and global peace and international stability and have that as an objective? whereas it is not a national military objective. That is a point we need to consider. Now, after this uh, little discussion, let's get back to the original definition as given in this document of aerospace power doctrine. I'll read it again. Aerospace power doctrine refers to the central beliefs and principles that guide the Indian Air Force in employment of aerospace power in furtherance of national objectives. Now, this seemingly perfect definition, I have a few problems. One is, is this aerospace power doctrine or is it Indian Air Force doctrine? Second, if aerospace power doctrine is enunciated by Indian Air Force, then are the other stakeholders in the sink? Third, 
employment of aerospace power is by indian air force is it true or there are other stakeholders and other uh, equipment and uh, policy holders who have a role to play in application of aerospace power and lastly should indian air force be employing aerospace power for furtherance of national objectives or for furtherance of national military objectives again we can't jump air indian air force is a subset of military and therefore focus of indian air force should be to for furtherance of national military objectives and military as a holistic entity should be doing what is required at the national this is my take on the issue now next is a very uh, important topic uh, that uh, the chairman also referred to somehow i have a feeling that integration and joint jointness these are two words which are used interchangeably as synonyms that is not true my take is jointness is between three individual entities or any number of entities that have developed their capabilities their thought process their processes individually and they have been put together for a common mission they come with their own set of equipment they come with their own set of thought processes they come with their own set of plans and then they try and integrate that in a joint venture to create a mission objective to achieve what is required in a mission whereas integration is when you integrate the resources at the base level and then develop a joint capability integrated together capability procure together in an integrated fashion develop a capability together and thereafter develop a thought process together develop a plan together and execute it to achieve the mission so these integration and jointness are two distinct things which in this document and most documents that i have come across they use it interchangeably which is which is not a good idea now uh, as far as uh, jointness is concerned i again quote from this uh, document it says aerospace power may not win a war on its own however no war can be won without it it is so true in today's context it's absolutely true a perfect perfect articulation but again i get back to the previous point aerospace power is not indian air force now if we look at uh, the armed forces uh, they used to be a monolithic uh, organization earlier then specialization developed maritime uh, forces went in the navy way then uh, last century air force came into being and they went the other way so individual basically three services now in some countries there are four five six services uh, on that account depending on which kind of uh, model they are looking at each one was developing its core competencies but more importantly their own thought process and everyone realized each service uh, realized that they needed some capabilities from the others so duplication was happening and obviously it leads to suboptimal resource utilization today all three services uh, in our context have their own air assets there are multiple services which have service to suffer in that all three services have their own uh, special force so these are the things that uh, lead to suboptimal resource utilization and especially when there is a resource crunch it pinches and most important thing when you develop capabilities individually for your own thought processes there is a disconnect in the thought process of each three, each of the service and when you need to apply applicate those capabilities into a war effort obviously it is not optimal because everyone thinks differently 
here i'll try to bring up a very uh, basic uh, difference between aerospace power land and maritime power i'm sure everyone has read history and would have read uh, many times that this general has lost war this admiral has lost war but you will never read that this air marshal has lost war why is that because they don't hold anything the land commander holds land if he loses land he becomes a loser navy holds water bodies air force or air power nothing therefore the thought process in all three is different and this disconnect leads to suboptimal war effort because everyone is thinking differently and therefore there is a need to switch off the jointness and move to integrated approach integration will not happen today if you start the process today it will take 3 4 5 6 years before the basic building block of integration starts unfortunately cds came into being uh, Three years, four years back, but nothing has moved in that uh, direction. And the model that was uh, uh, propagated of air defense command and geographical theater command, chief of air staff in his uh, foreword in this document itself has uh, rejected that uh, in totality. Now again, I quote: As far as the jointness is concerned, and uh, air power or aerospace power is concerned from this doctrine it says aerospace power can best be exploited jointly with other components of military true but independently in tandem with diplomatic efforts and other elements of comprehensive national power here again you get a sense that aerospace power wants to create a niche of itself outside the military domain which may not be a very good thing very good thing it, it is not a very good thing in my opinion aerospace power needs to be a subset of military power and military needs to be a subset of national objective and that chain should not be bypassed here there is a tendency to create a role special role first among equal and maybe slightly more for aerospace power which uh, obviously uh, it doesn't uh, gel well with a uh, lot of stakeholders second thing i quote is it is aerospace power that enables land and naval forces to undertake sustained operations beyond their physical operating mediums leading to in the increasingly accepted perception that aerospace power is the linchpin of joint operations now here uh, this sentence does not augur well for integration aerospace power is a subset of military power and all are equal and all have their specialization you need to move together you cannot say other two are dependent on you therefore they are subservient no it cannot happen that way this is something which is uh, uh, i would find awkward in this doctrine which is not clearly addressed and uh, often aerospace power and in in air force are interchangeably used and confused which is not the case it should not be the case said uh, sorry for the inconvenience yeah. uh, so there is a request from some audience uh, that if you can mix little bit of hindi also because this uh, okay webinar is okay. open to all over india Okay. Okay. So people from far away places also listening. So if okay. you can, it's up okay. to you. Okay. I'll 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 do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Very interesting. That. And uh, the next issue I have on this case is the state of the state. Ah, uh, ये doctrine जो है ये तीन तरह के state बताती है. एक जब लड़ाई हो रही है, एक जब शांति है, एक बीच का no peace no war जिसमें ना लड़ाई है ना शांति है. ये तीन तरह की चीज के बारे में बताती है. ये पहली बार है ऐसा हो रहा है. नहीं तो जो पुरानी डॉक्टर है उसमें कहा जाता था कि या तो पीस है या लड़ाई है और लड़ाई में अलग अलग तरह का लेवल है लिमिटेड लड़ाई है या अनकन्वेंशनल लड़ाई है या कन्वेंशनल लड़ाई है या न्यूक्लियर वॉर है उस तरह का लेवल दिया गया था पर इस डॉक्टर में तीन स्टेट दिया गया है लड़ाई शांति और बीच का जहां ना शांति है ना लड़ाई तो एयर ऑपरेशन है 
इन तीनों में अलग अलग तरीके से दिए गए हैं देर इज कंटिन्यूस एयर ऑपरेशन लाइक एयर डिफेंस एयर स्पेस कंट्रोल मोबिलिटी डिप्लोमेसी केपेबिलिटी एनहेंसमेंट देर आर नॉन काइनेटिक जिसमें वेपन का यूज नहीं होता है जैसे इंफॉर्मेशन वॉरफेयर इंटेलिजेंस सर्विलेंस रिकॉग्निशन डिटेरेंस और एक है जिसमें काइनेटिक एयर ऑपरेशन जिसमें वेपन्स का यूज होता है एयर डिफेंस हो गया ऑफेंसिव एयर डिफेंस हो गया प्यूनेटिव स्ट्राइक हो गया कंट्रोल ऑफ एयर हो गया ऑफेंसिव एक्शन हो गया ये सब है बट ये जो स्टेट ऑफ स्टेट जिसको मैं कह रहा हूँ इस डॉक्टर ने तीन में डिवाइड कर दिया है ये मेरे हिसाब से एक नया नॉमन क्लेचर है सब लोग अच्छा अच्छा नॉमन क्लेचर यूज करना चाहते हैं बट मेरे पर्सनल हिसाब से बिकॉज डॉक्टर इज अ थॉट प्रोसेस थॉट इज ऑफ इंडिविजुअल एंड देर फॉर यू नीड टू लुक एट द स्टेट ऑफ कॉम्बेटेंट जो योद्धा है उसका ध्यान रखना चाहिए योद्धा के पास सिर्फ दो ही स्टेट होते हैं या तो वो लड़ाई कर रहा है या वो लड़ाई की तैयारी कर रहा है वॉर और प्रिपरेशन ऑफ वॉर देर इज नथिंग एल्स फॉर ए वॉरियर फॉर ए कॉम्बेटेंट देर आर जस्ट टू स्टेट इधर इज अट वॉर और इज प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर वॉर अनलेस इज सिक और ओनली दैट इज नॉट ऑन ड्यूटी therefore the state of the state also needs to reflect that either you are at war or you are preparing for war there is nothing in between no peace no war yes everyone states that today everyone is almost every every state is at no peace no war but that is not true for the combat forces combat forces have very simple objective binary definition ya to war hai ya preparation of war aur koi state nahi hai inke एक जो गार्ड है जो बाहर खड़ा है किसी इंस्टीट्यूशन को या किसी यूनिट को या किसी आर्मरी को गार्ड कर रहा है जब तक वो गार्ड ड्यूटी पे है एज फर एज इज कंसर्न इट्स अ वॉर फॉर हेम बिकॉज जब लड़ाई होगी तब उसका भी एग्जैक्टली वही काम होगा जो ओ आर पी पायलट है ऑपरेशनल रेडिएशन प्लेटफॉर्म का पायलट है उसके लिए जब लड़ाई होगी जो अभी शांति है या नहीं है उससे कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता उसका काम एग्जैक्टली सेम है तो उसका थॉट प्रोसेस जो है उसका जो सोच विचार का तरीका वो एग्जैक्टली सेम है तो जो डॉक्टरिन है वो भी इन दो चीजों पे फोकस रहनी चाहिए इधर यू आर एट वॉर और यू आर प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर वॉर नथिंग एल्स दिस इज वॉट माई टेक इज ऑन दिस देन कम टू द नेक्स्ट चैप्टर दैट आई मेंशन अर्लियर इट सेज एयर स्ट्रैटेजी अगेन डिड द टीम दैट वॉज कंपाइलिंग दिस डॉक्यूमेंट फॉरगेट that we are talking about aerospace doctrine and therefore aerospace strategy or it was intentional that you deleted space because there is nothing you can do about it you restricted yourself to air strategy if that be the case then we must understand the limitation that indian air force can give air power and not aerospace power as of now or if you want to graduate into aerospace power then you need to take all other stakeholders and make aerospace strategy and not restrict yourself to air strategy and in peace uh, uh, there are uh, about five issues that are given protection deterrence diplomacy national building induction of indigenous act equipment this is the summary of air strategy given in this document but important issue is in peace time there is no linkage of air strategy with other two services is it true if it is true it is a very sad state of affairs you cannot exist in isolation whether it is peace or war you have to have linkage with other two services in peace and in war if you don't have it in peace you cannot have it in war and then air strategy is absolutely silent on internal security which is a objective of uh, which is an air force objective now uh, in the next uh, stage no war no peace na ladai na yudh ke samay mein jo air strategy hai usme ye wo char panch cheeze darshati hai information dominance ki जहां पे आपके पास ज्यादा इंफॉर्मेशन हो वो किया जाए एंड दिस इज द फर्स्ट टाइम दिस डॉक्टर इन यूज द वर्ड इंटीग्रेटेड आई एस आर आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू सी दैट इट वाज थिंकिंग ऑफ इंटीग्रेशन एटलीस्ट एट दिस स्टेज टुवर्ड्स द फ्लैग एंड द वर्ड इंटीग्रेशन इज एक्चुअली कमिंग टू बी देन इट टॉक्स अबाउट शेपिंग ऑपरेशन शेपिंग ऑपरेशन में रैपिड मोबिलिटी जैसे 
चाइना बॉर्डर के साथ हुआ जल्दी से अपना फौज को वहां एयरफोर्स ले गया उसके बारे में बात करती है इन्फ्लुएंसिंग ऑपरेशन केपेबिलिटी डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन एंड एक्सटर्नल सिक्योरिटी ऑफ इंटरनल सिक्योरिटी फाइनली नो वॉर नो पीस जोन में आ गया है जिसमें सर्विलेंस है इंटरसेप्शन है काउंटर यू ऑपरेशन यूनिटिव एक्शन है पर यह सब पीस टाइम में भी होने चाहिए उसके बाद वॉर टाइम एयर स्ट्रेटजी के बारे में बात करता है जिसमें कमांड एंड कंट्रोल ऑफ एयर ऑपरेशन की बात करते हैं ये बट इसमें दो चीजें बहुत महत्वपूर्ण हैं जो इम्पोर्टेंट हैं जब वो एप्लीकेशन ऑफ कॉम्बैट एयर पार की बात करते हैं तो उसके बारे में एक टर्म यूज करते हैं कोऑर्डिनेटेड ऑपरेशन कोऑर्डिनेटेड ऑपरेशन विद आर्मी इंट्रोडिक्शन एंड बैटल फील्ड एयर स्ट्राइक एंड कोऑर्डिनेटेड ऑपरेशन विद नेवी एंटी शिपिंग स्ट्राइक एंड कोस्टल स्ट्राइक What are these coordinated operations? Though they try to explain, it is somewhere uh, like a joint operation. No. Is it integrated operation? No. It is a coordinated operation. It's a third field, which is I would say a step lower than a joint operation. So as far as this doctrine is concerned, during war time, it is talking about integration with other two services at a level lower than a jointness, which even which exists today. which is little surprising though it talks about coordinating with army coordinating with navy but that is not how war is fought or how war should be fought it needs to be fought in an integrated manner where capability thought planning everything is in unison unless you have that you are going to lose it and if God forbid India has to lose the next war. Aerospace power or Indian Air Force will be solely responsible for it for this approach. And then it talks about application of combat power in strategic operations, enhancing operations, info warfare, cyber warfare, air mobility, enabling operations. In enabling operations, it doesn't really link with the other two services at all. You have fantastic air assets uh, with the Indian Navy. you have a phenomenal air assets with the indian army but when you build up an isr in enabling ops it doesn't really uh, coordinate with other two it doesn't have an integrated plan with other two. so there is a disconnect uh, in the doctrine as far as uh, probably we have not seen war for a long time that is why this disconnect is coming then there are sustaining operations protection technologistics adam hrm training ops testing everything is there but what is missing is maintenance i don't know how can an air power talk about a doctrine which does not have maintenance word in it entire doctrine of 87 page doesn't have a maintenance word in it and especially during war it surprises now uh, as far as the a strategy instead of this strategy it uh, lists out about uh, again uh, six uh, pillars battle space transparency networking cyber info warfare electronic warfare technologistics adam hrm training again maintenance missing can you have an air strategy without coordinating with other two services are other two services not important pillars of air strategy or aerospace strategy we need to think about it then it gives a chapter on mapping the future if you go back to the basic definition of doctrine doctrine is my belief system of an institution of individuals that uh, form the institution of key decision takers that articulate it and put it down it says my belief system today so how can you map the future how can i say my belief system tomorrow will be this i can't say that if my belief system today is that this is how it will progress then that is what the doctrine is you can't map the future as far as the doctrine is concerned yes doctrine is evolutionary in nature in fact it is retrospective you build up your belief system with a experience of uh, multiple facets uh, over a period of a decade that is why doctrine normally get revised 5 or 10 years because that is the time it takes to change the belief system 
where new in equipment has come new ways have come new methodology has come new events have taken place across the globe from where you learned you interact with various stakeholders and their experiences come so it takes time so you can't map a future in the doctor what you can map is what has happened till now and this is your doctrine today what is likely to happen tomorrow what your belief is again that is today's doctrine not tomorrow's and similarly for technology what lies ahead we don't know but three things are absolutely clear which are conspicuous by their absence in this one is battle space expansion that is taking place at rapid rate secondly as communication transparency and resource optimization is a necessity and therefore decision making will gravitate towards centralization whether you like it or not because it is trans battle space is trans getting transparent everything is available and therefore resource optimization can be done and must be done and therefore there is a need to restructure our organization the present one yes it is good for the wars of yesterday we need to have a new structure with a new doctrine the new thought process it is a necessity it is not an option anymore and what is change in the battle space if you look across the globe what is happening when the battle field has changed the battle field as well battle field has changed to battle space there is a physical domain which has land maritime air space and there is a virtual dimension also now add it to it most important thing battle space transparency there are ways and means to achieve that there are ways and means to deny that and now there is a battle going on between these two and you need to have capability to achieve transparency so that you can take appropriate decisions third thing is time compression is taking place the reaction time available is very less reaction time available is minimal now if you recall uh, 2016 india carried out a surgical strike uh, using uh, special forces it took 11 days balakot again after uh, 14th february uh, blast in which we lost 40 brave men 11 days is this time uh, going to be available next time anything happens definitely not the time is compressed the time available from an event to the time you decide to react is definitely low and that needs to find a place in the doctrine that we need to have a faster decision making process and a faster implementation process fourth aspect if you look across the globe the battle between offense and defense has always been balanced but now with new tools available with long range vectors available it is definitely tilting towards offense that means first movers advantage is going to be phenomenal phenomenal and the one who reacts will only be playing a catch up game therefore the doctrine must reflect this thought process of being proactive we've been reactive from reactive from india reacts india doesn't react we switched over to india reacts now we need to change that to india acts so that shift should i feel be part of the offensive arm of the indian military the aerospace part should be part of that then uh, domain relevance uh, cyber communication need be all these domains are gradually increasing their space and the kinetic uh, power normally in aerospace power associated with combat aircraft fighter aircraft that is shrinking so everyone is becoming more relevant and therefore we need to have a holistic approach in this and it somewhere mentions uh, hybrid is a new concept but rarely i i don't agree with that all because war has always been hybrid it is the content of various issues in the hybrid that has changed it has become more balanced now but uh, concept is not a new one and uh, coming to the end uh, towards atmanirbhar bharat uh, as a doctrinal uh, issue is it a belief is it a belief of the organization or is it just a rhetoric 
and we need to really think about it if it is a belief then uh, actually uh, we should be ordering only everything indian but that is not the case so you need to be realistic in this you need to build up capability you need to build up self reliance and both need to move together you can't have a a rhetoric of atmanirbhar and continue to buy uh, equipment uh, that is not uh, indian indigenous you need to hand hold the domestic uh, private sector public sector everyone together for that you need to take a capability hit for some time you need to take that if you think you believe you your belief is atmanirbhar but if it is just a rhetoric then we'll continue to go where we are doing and you need to define a time frame you can't just say uh, it open ended that i will be atmanirbhar and uh, leave it at that you need to define time frame and move uh, accordingly and that that should be a belief and not a rhetoric then in the end uh, it gives uh, doctrinal suggestions moving from threat based and demanded to capability demanded and bridge demand gap supply gap basically seeking more resources practically it is not possible we need to look at it very very realistic doctrine is a belief but it is a belief uh, vested in reality it is not a wish list that uh, you can uh, slip it uh, through a document like this you shouldn't as far as uh, changing the planning uh, paradigm from threat based and demanded to capability demanded well the first capability development plan was made two decades back so uh, as far as uh, air force is concerned particularly it's been uh, two decades old uh, thing uh, there is nothing new that you suggesting uh, in threat based uh, and demanded to capability demanded no let's let's cut out the obfuscation uh, in uh, such an important document we should have simple words which can be understood by each and every warrior each and every scholar each and every uh, stakeholder clearly unambiguously then only they'll be able to contribute and we need to move forward then it uh, suggests technology the technology enabled tools for plug and play capabilities for army and navy well this is surprising how can indian air force doctrine suggest what should other two services procure is there a stake in that yes there is a military stake in that but this is not a place where you suggest what you others procure and how should they procure it emphasis on research and development yes it is linked to atmanirbhar professional military education definitely there is a need for that and the last sentence is a little disconcerting i quote joint structures for right sizing joint training and operations while maintaining service specific core competencies this actually washes off everything that is good in this topic because you cannot have joint structures you have to have a integrated approach right sizing definitely joint training no integrated training yes integrated operations yes joint operations no and you degraded that to coordinated operations definitely not accepted and while maintaining service specific core competency what are you going to do as a service specific core competency fight an air war and win air war and lose the land or lose the maritime battle definitely this has undone everything good has done in this talk this is for me personally this is absolutely unacceptable you cannot have develop think of having service specific core competency no everything is for the nation a nation has a military and therefore everything is for the military and in that you are a subset and therefore your aim is to support the military to support the nation you cannot create a niche area for yourself and say no i will do this this way definitely not summing up it's a good comprehensive and updated document definitely much better than the last version it gives a clear view about iif thought process jo iif indian air force sochta hai uske bare mein bahut acha ek samagam deta hai 
पर ये जो सोच है अभी की जो इस डॉक्यूमेंट में दी गई है वो उसको अभी और इवॉल्व होना है ताकि हम जो कल हमारी सिचुएशन हो उसको ठीक से हैंडल कर सके अभी तक की सोच जो है वो इसने डाल दी है बहुत अच्छे तरीके से डाली है पर उस सोच को अभी इवॉल्व होना है ओवरऑल इट इज अ गुड बिगनिंग बहुत अच्छा डॉक्यूमेंट है अपडेटेड वर्जन है पब्लिक डिबेट में आया है पब्लिक डोमेन में आया है डिबेट हो रहा है इसके ऊपर ये सबसे बढ़िया बात है अब इसके ऊपर यहाँ से इस बेस्ट डॉक्यूमेंट से आगे ले जाना है उसके लिए हमें बहुत काम करना है तो आई विल कॉम्प्लीमेंट द टीम फॉर मेकिंग अ गुड कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव डॉक्यूमेंट पुटिंग इट इन पब्लिक डोमेन एंड डिबेटिंग आई एम श्योर एवरी वन वुड है मल्टीपल आर्टिकल्स एंड यू जस्ट रीड द नेम ऑफ द ऑथर और रैंक यू नो विच कलर यूनिफॉर्म यू वेयर यू विल नो वट इज गिवन इन दैट बट दैट इज नॉट हाउ इट शुड बी so we need to move forward evolve from this base document i have finished i would uh, like if there are any comments questions anything thank you sir uh, thank you sir i can really thank you enough for your free frank and honest uh, opinions and honest critic of the uh, document i really wish the air force in an air force was listening to this uh, discussion and uh, so i think uh, as you rightly said is a mixed bag as far as the doctrine is concerned there are definitely uh, several novelty in the uh, document but there are a lot of uh, miles to cover to really uh, have a, a solid doctrine uh, before us i am not actually venturing to summarize what you said although i have taken down some uh, uh, points but i think uh, we'll put up your video entirely uh, 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 the entire video will be put up in our website and youtube youtube and this can be uh listen by others any time so uh, i'm not wasting any time in summarizing what you said uh, so i think i will open the floor to, uh, to some questions or comments we are taking questions only through the chat options so we have uh, some 20 odd minutes so those who want to put up questions or comment they can still use the time uh, the available time so since i am the chair so i will take the the advantage of my position in asking and raising two questions uh, sir <clears throat> as you know i think the when the uh, doctrine was being prepared or when it was released finally to the public domain so uh, we have the experience of uh, russian invasion and russia ukraine war so you know the air power uh, has not been optimally used uh, at least by uh, russia in ukraine so i think there is some lessons and people are talking about the role of air power in future conflict so i am surprised that uh, 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 my question is whether those lessons have been imbibed in the doctrine that is my first question then i think uh, there is a perennial debate i think you refer to in your presentation about the what should the primary role of the uh, air force and not, not so long ago uh, we had the, the the first cbs making some remarks which which was not uh, taken up uh, very uh, kindly by the air force i think that that reflects uh, the understanding of each other particularly the army and air force army has its own views of air force and air force has its own views of its role uh, uh, providing support to the army i think over the years uh, their uh, own belief system have actually uh, become rigid rigid i mean from your discussion it came to me it 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 uh, became uh, quite clear that uh, i think uh, the air force is acting independently its military object its own objectives are not matching with the national military objectives although i don't actually blame Uh, here the air force uh, here I, i think the doct military doctrines uh, or objectives are not publicly uh, specified there is a rm of directives but whether uh, uh, the this doctrine actually captures that i don't know uh, and could be uh, that they have not actually put up their mind uh, to match uh, the those objectives uh, uh, rm of, of directives with the ifs uh, objectives so maybe you can clarify that i think I, i was i had another point but i um, uh, escaped that so probably you can answer these two and then we can uh, take up other okay, uh, as far as the russia ukraine war is concerned it's still unfolding and uh, initial lessons indicate uh, i won't say suboptimal i would say suboptimal utilization of air power and uh, where probably probably they've gone wrong is in the first tenant of uh, changing battlefield scenario that is battlefield transparency and expansion of battlefields if you understand that then 
you will be in a better position to employ your kinetic power, which possibly Russia has failed and Ukraine with the help of various uh, other countries have been able to create a fairly good battle space transparency. I'm sure some of you would have seen a video uh, which captures a, a Russian uh, helicopter flying at ultra low level being shot uh, by a, a handheld uh, man portable uh, SAM. If you uh, look carefully, that picture has been taken by a, a handheld, uh, probably mobile phone or a camera. Now, if you're flying at ultra low level, the maximum range uh, you will be picked up or you will be heard as a helicopter it will be about a couple of kilometers and not more than that in that terrain. And in that, it may not be possible to engage it with the man pads where you need to punch the nitrogen bottle to cool the head and take a lock on and hit it. But you're ready with the camera because you already know that someone is coming, somebody has already informed you that be ready at this place at this time, then you'll be able to capture it. So battle space transparency is an area where possibly Russia has not put in adequate effort, either because of lack of capability or lack of intent or lack of will, I do not know at this juncture. Once war is over, more documents will come out, more analysis will come out, we will know for sure. But right now, that appears to be the differential between the two. As far as the CDS is concerned, you talk about integration on the first day itself, of taking over uh, late General Bipin Rawat had said creation of Air Defense Command. Four years, nothing has happened. Why? Because your approach has to be together. If you don't think together, you can't reach a common solution. If you think and you want to uh, maintain your domains or you want to crush other domains and build another domain separately, it is not going to happen. It is not a very good uh, amicable solution. You need to think of nation first, rest later. If you have that as your thought process, you will never go wrong. The problem is that is not the case. As uh, typically in peacetime st air strategy given in the AI doctrine 2022, other two services don't even figure. If you can't talk to each other in peace, how are you going to fight? Go together. Third issue. RM's op directive is classified and therefore not part of this. It has a separate, uh, it is a separate document and separate field altogether. Fortunately, it is much more comprehensive than this doctrine puts out. It is much more integrated than this doctrine puts out. So I think we have several questions. So the first question, I think you know him, uh, Colonel Kevin, who was also in IDSA when you were there. So he had three questions, but I will take uh, two questions first. Is it possible to frame a national security policy or strategy or Air Force doctrine without an assessment of the potential threats and why they exist? What are the situations which can cause such threats, which are the red lines uh, which cannot accept and what retaliation and cause thereof are willing to be in. <laughs> too, too long a question, too many, yeah, so too many, many parameters. Dr. Gaurav, All I would say is... Uh, Dr. Gaurav, can you just uh, unmute uh, Colonel Kevin? I can see his photo. So he's a military veteran, so uh, he should be given an opportunity. Yeah, I understand to... that. Absolutely. Uh, you can't create a strategy in uh, empty space. Yes, no. uh, Colonel Kevin is there. Colonel Kevin, please go ahead yeah, and uh... briefly, briefly your questions. Yeah, thank you so much for a very a good talk and very critical uh, analysis of uh, the doctrine, sir. And uh, lovely to be here at this forum. Uh, I've been, you know, looking at the defense industry now and the whole uh, Indian security. Uh, uh, I would say. Scenario. Can you speak a little yeah, louder, please? Yeah, louder. I've been, yeah. actually, this uh, these questions of mine are not uh, actually so pertinent to the Air Force uh, per se. Uh, it's at a slightly higher level, but I believe that unless we are clear at a higher level, uh, how can we draw out the doctrines of the individual, uh, you know, military forces? Uh, we are bound to go askew. So the, uh, uh, you know, research that I've been doing is showing that uh, ultimately it is the, the military forces of India are required to protect the people of India. You mentioned nation first. 
absolutely mm -hmm. right. I also completely uh, uh, agree with that nation first, but the nation consists of the people. So if any military uh, you know, doctrine is to be created, we have to be focused on protecting the people of India. So once that is clear and once that is put in our national security strategy or policy, we should draw out our Air Force doctrine from that. Uh, that's my understanding. Because otherwise, uh, you know, simply saying that we want this and we want that and at what cost to the people because the money, where would the money come from? There is, there is the uh, India doesn't have the kind of money to spend on 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 such uh, high tech and uh, you know uh, systems. So that is the thing. Uh, I've written my points, my questions here. You can you know draw from whatever. But the broad thing that I am grappling now is that India has to provide security to the people at the least cost to them because we don't have that kind of money, and that is probably the way forward. And uh, no, so what do you think about that? I, I fully agree with you. Nation, first I said nation means people only. It doesn't mean just land and water and uh, water bodies. No, it doesn't. Nation means people. We need to protect that. First. Second point, I fully agree. It needs to be at the least cost to the people of the country. Security needs to be at the least cost. Absolutely in agreement. Third, the base document has to be a national policy, national security strategy. From there flows the uh, military strategy. There flows the Air Force strategy. As far as the doctrine is concerned, it's slightly different in context. Doctrine is a belief system, as I put it. It's a belief system. I believe that this is what is the best way of doing a thing. This is what I am, and this is the best way of doing a thing with these assets, etc., etc., etc. It takes into cognizance what I have, what I don't have, what I'm likely to have, what I may not get, and what are the situations that are likely to emerge. So doctor is not a strategy. No, it is not a strategy. It is a belief system. Belief system of people who man the institution. So let's not link the two. They are independent. Yes, doctrine has a role to play in strategy. Strategy has a role to play in doctrine, but they are not uh, subsets of each other. No, they are not. And as far as the equipment uh, procurement policy is concerned or equipment uh, procurement is concerned, there are uh, two issues. Doctrine looks at what is likely to happen, what I believe is capable system or uh, uh, capable capability that uh, I need. The, the per person who holds the purse strings decides what the money available. And then uh, it's a loop that you iterate, reiterate, reiterate n number of times to reach a common solution, common ground. That, okay, we'll scale down the capability. We'll do with this, you scale up the money. That is how it works. But doctrine definitely is not a place where you say, I need more resources. No, it is not. And uh, other than the last suggestion, the doctrine actually doesn't talk about it. So that is a, a very good point about this talk. OK, sir. So I, uh, sir, we have also General Alok Dev. Uh, I know uh, you also know him very well. So he's also attending. So if he's listening, uh, uh, I will request him uh, uh, if he has uh, any comments or questions to, uh, to ask Bupatrin Khera. Sir, you are unmuted. Thank you, Dr. Vera, for uh, organizing discussion. This is my first exposure to a discussion on the latest aerospace doctrine. And uh, I can only compliment Group Captain Khera for a very frank, forthright, and professionally honest exposition of views. He's given his viewpoint. And uh, he has taken us through the entire structure of that paper with a lot of deliberation. And one has picked up a fair amount uh, from that. And one appreciates the amount of work which has gone into formulating that doctrine. And like any military paper, which is getting updated and which is open to public scrutiny, obviously there will be issues which he has brought out very, very clearly. I mean, the issues which is written about, uh, especially about aerospace. Aerospace is a new domain for the, uh, it's a old, it's a fairly old domain as far as India is concerned. But purely in the military sphere, it is comparatively newer. So where exactly does the Air Force stand with respect to the rest of the country in utilization of aerospace, utilization of aerospace assets? 
construction, building, deploying, employing aerospace assets. That is a point which is brought out very well. Uh, the issue about deterrence too, I was a little surprised to see that deterrence came later after defense and military action. Because then, well, then you haven't utilized the deter uh, deterring power of the air instrument at all. So maybe there's a reason to it, which uh, when somebody who's written this paper, when he hears these questions, maybe somebody else will answer later on. That is how these debates get uh, activated and we get more and more educated. So that point about deterrence first is extremely uh, uh, relevant. And uh, the issue of coordination, jointness and integration, well, I couldn't agree more with him. Unfortunately, yes, we have uh, legacy mindsets. We've all grown up in a certain way. And um, uh, we need to go a long, long way on this before we come on to even jargon which is acceptable and then implementing that uh, jargon into concept practice on ground uh, and the aspect about uh, no mention of maintenance in the doctrine that itself is uh, that is surprising especially when mro maintenance repair and overhaul is such a huge thing worldwide and uh, getting more and more important by the day with uh, devices like artificial intelligence being used to enhance and predict uh, what needs to be done to maintain equipment systems. Uh, he brought out, uh, as far as Ukraine is concerned, yes, he's brought out, uh, the, uh, he brought out the issue of the first mover advantage earlier on in a different uh, context, but it's uh, equally applicable to Ukraine as he brought out later. I just have a couple of points when normally the Air Force has used to have a concept of operations. When I used to be in the service, there used to be a slide which talked about a concept of operation and it talked about uh, uh, sorting out the enemy Air Force first. I don't remember the exact phrases. Maybe in that now, uh, suppression of enemy air defenses would take a greater priority as compared to uh, anything else. Because as he said, uh, transparency and finding out where the actual threat lies so that you could neutralize that and then send in your air package to catch out the task to envisage because the air envelope is getting more and more contested. And I think the task for the Air Force is getting more and more challenging. Uh, the uh, doctrine has not talked about, uh, maybe it didn't want to go too much in the future. Uh, it's not talked about deployment of uh, drones and uh, swarms and things of that nature. We haven't come to that stage yet. We are still in the developing stages. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe there'll be appendices to this later. Uh, my question is basically on uh, the new vertical which the Air Force has made, uh, the, uh, what's it called, the new vertical which was inaugurated about a few months ago on rockets and missile systems. Uh, I don't know what it is, weapons, weapon vertical. It's a weapons vertical. So where does that figure into the doctrine, if it does at all? How is its role articulated? And uh, does Group Captain Khera have any views on this uh, rocket force, whether that is also going to be a part of this vertical and what its uh, employment is uh, going to be? Has that been given out in any doctrinal form whatsoever? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, as far as uh, the role of air power in war is concerned, suppression of enemy air defenses, counter operation of the, they are mentioned as part of the air strategy. I skipped that because uh, that is normally uh, known to almost everyone, and uh, there was a time limitation in that. And as far as the role, future role of UAV, small, etc., is concerned, that is also mentioned as part of uh, the uh, likely future. Is is a part of this document. So on that way, uh, it is covered almost all facets. So nothing is missed out other than uh, the issues that I've mentioned. As far as the new vertical of uh, weapon system uh, operators is concerned, uh, it's an HR function uh, where you train a different uh, set of people for a different role. So as far as the doctrinal uh, thought process is concerned, how the force is going to be ap applied uh, in a warlike situation, uh, that more or less remains the same, whether it's a person A or a person B, and person A is trained uh, in this fashion, person B is trained in this fashion, that really uh, will not make much of a difference. As far as the existence of a new uh, vertical called rock, rocket force, uh, if that comes into being, well, uh, I don't know which way are we are heading. We are heading into 
uh, creating an integrated structure for fighting a war that India may face, or uh, we are heading and creating splintered groups of individual uh, fiefdoms and uh, domains, and uh, then later think of coordinating that. We need to think about that. Unless uh, we are clear, uh, if that is nation first, and we need to fight single war, all uh, hands on the deck together, uh, it's not going to work out. Thank you, sir. So, uh, 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 you, if you are willing, then we can take up a few more questions. Uh, the program was originally for one hour, but we have already exceeded by 15 or 15 odd minutes. So, can we you take can a few questions? Two, two things I would like to mention. Firstly, there is hardly anyone who discusses air power or airspace power. So it's very interesting to discuss that. Okay. And secondly, in, very interesting for me because uh, JNU is one of the best universities in the country and I'm inter getting to interact with them. And as far as I'm concerned, I've never been, never set a foot on any university. Oh, no, no. So that, so we'll very soon invite so, you physically. So, uh, although JNU has been kind enough to give me a bachelor's degree and a medal and uh, Madras University was kind enough to give me post-graduation and a medal, but uh, physically I have never uh, visited. A no, we, would love, we would love to invite you physically. <laughs> so the only thing is that if we invite you uh, uh, physically, then probably you would uh, interact with uh, 10 or 20. But Absolutely online, no yeah. issue. This is good. Yeah, Especially so in this kind soon, of weather, uh, online is much better. Yeah, so very soon we'll have you physically and uh, we have a conference room so we can invite uh, students and faculty so that we can interact uh, maybe uh, in a closed door setting. Uh, so we we'll love to do, uh, do that. So we, I, I think we'll take two, three uh, small questions and then uh, we'll wind up. So one question is from our PhD student, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Saral. So he wants to know how is IF seeing its long-term or strategic role in the Indo-Pacific region? Is it more deterrence-centric in nature? So I don't know whether he's wanting your opinion on the doctrine uh, or uh, whether the doctrine has actually uh, uh, covered this aspect. No, doctrine doesn't cover this aspect specifically that uh, which area or which region. It is, a, again, I would say doctrine is a just belief system. It doesn't talk about specific that in this area, uh, this is the capability, in this area, this is the capability, no. As far as the objectives are concerned, uh, they are very clear. Uh, Indian Air Force objectives, they lay out uh, offensive action first uh, before the deterrence. For what reason? I don't really know. It should be the other way around uh, as far as all practical purposes are concerned. You need to deter first. If deterrence fails, you need to win the war. And as far as uh, Indo-Pacific is concerned, it's a very vast area. We have very, very limited resources to to go deep into the ocean because uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, we are not in a, in a state of uh, military coordination with any other state where we can go and operate military systems from there. No, we don't have that kind of a thing. So we'll have to be based on airfields within India. And the only thing that can extend reach is uh, in-flight refueling. And that the numbers are very, very limited. So uh, we need to take cognizance of that fact that uh, it's a deterrence in Indian Ocean region right now is a wishful thinking. Can we achieve it through air power? Very, very limited capability. Do we want to? Yes, but it will require a lot of resource investment. Lots of it, lots of it. We don't have that kind of a resource right now. Okay, so uh, thank you, sir. So there are some other questions, but I think we'll take up in some other occasion. So when you come physically here. So now I request my colleague, Dr. Gaurav Tyagi to propose a vote of thanks and wind up. Dr. Gaurav. Dr. Gaurav. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Your vote of thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Captain Kishore Kumar Khira for his in-depth analysis of Indian Air Force doctrine and put it so eloquently uh, that everybody understood the nuances of it. And I'm sure this talk will help the participant to understand the vision and objectives of uh, Indian Air Force. 
I would also like to thank participants for uh, joining in such great numbers. Uh, even the weather outside in Delhi over here is of chais and pakoras, and still you take out time, time out of your busy schedule to attend this very insightful talk. I can see some of the faculty members from JNU joining this talk. I would also like to thank them. I can see uh, uh, people from uh, various embassies were in the talk. I'm also thankful to them. Uh, I'm also thankful to HRDC JNU for uh, helping us with the logistics for this uh, uh, special lecture that we organized. And in the end, I would like to thank our fear person, uh, Dr. Bhaira for this initiative and inviting group captain Kishore Kumar Khera for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav. Uh, uh, sir, if you don't mind, so we, we are anyway putting up the video in the YouTube, but we are also planning to prepare a summary report of the, your lecture and the discussions and put it on the website uh, through and we'll, and we'll uh, put it in our social media and uh, uh, other social media platforms. So hope that's okay with you. Do, do what you want. Only thing yeah. is the uh, threat to my life will increase. Don't worry about that. <laughs> No, sir. So we believe in a constructive uh, critique of the uh, policy. And I think we had a very good discussion. And uh, so this is a healthy discussion, in, in fact. And, uh, uh, and we know the, uh, how the, the doctrine, the, the work preparedness should move ahead. And this is our small academic contribution uh, towards that endeavor. And I really thank you for, for making such an honest and free, frank uh, presentation. We really appreciate that. And we hope to see you again uh, in our future endeavor. Anytime. All the best. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.